Hi, 10th grade, Miss Boyd here, and I'm going to talk about your outside reading book, The Yearling, uh, chapters one through four, your first reading, okay? So, firstly, with your author, Marjorie Kennan Rawlings, <clears throat> just a little bit about her. She was born in Washington, D.C. in 1896, and <clears throat> she spent her summers with her father in Wisconsin on a farm, and once she got older and she got married, she bought, with her husband, a 72 acres down in Florida, which is where this takes place. <clears throat> and once she moved down to that rural area, um, just like the Baxters live, that's kind of where she got her inspiration for writing and her voice for writing and her ideas for this book. So this book <clears throat> won a Pulitzer Prize in 1938. And, I mean, you can tell your author is descriptive extremely, okay? And she describes basically what she saw every day where she lived in Florida, okay? So, chapter one. It starts off and it says it's April, okay? Um, the reason I'm pointing that out is uh, your title is The Yearling, so there's a theme of a year running through a lot of different bits and pieces, okay, including the amount of time this book takes place. So it starts in April and it starts off with your boy, Jody, okay, and <clears throat> he's supposed to be doing work, um, but as his mind wanders and thinks about other things, he tends to come up with something else to do instead of the work like hoeing the the ground for crops and stuff like that that he's supposed to be doing. He's like, mm, maybe I should go here or there or do this or that. So in the very first paragraph, he thinks about his mother and what she would be doing because he doesn't want to get busted. And it talks about that she would be sweeping the floor with a broom of tie tie, which is kind of tall grass. And then after that, if you were lucky, she would scrub it with the corn shuck scrub. Immediately, your mind should say, it doesn't say broom. It doesn't say sponge or brush. Everything that they have, the Baxters have, they make by hand. Everything, including the house that they live in. Okay, so he talks himself out of work. And he comes up with the excuse of, oh, I think there's a bee tree. I should go get honey. And he runs off to the Glen, which is one of his favorite places to go. Okay. So as he's walking away, <clears throat> it talks about the three dogs that they have. So it says, rip the bulldog and perk the new feist. That's the new dog that they have. Kind of run up to him and then go away. And he thinks about old Julia. Okay. And Rip and Perk come up to him and they don't really care necessarily about the humans. All they care about is the hunt. But old Julia is different. But old Julia only cares about Henny, the father. Okay. Um, doesn't really care about Jody. And as far as Jody, from the beginning, he's not very old. He's about 12, so I think middle school age. Um, all he thinks about when he sees dogs is he wishes he had something like old Julia and Penny. Or he thinks about his grandma Hutto and her dog and how their um, that dog just loves grandma Hutto. And so from the beginning, you have this statement that says he would like anything that was his own that licked his face and followed him as old Julia followed his father. So from the very beginning, it presents to you as... Um, Jody, this young boy that just longs to have something to call his own. So, the April sky, he runs out, and <clears throat> he runs, literally, it takes a jog, to the Glen, and it describes it as a secret and lovely place with clear springs. Um, it's a place that the Baxters use a lot, um, and it describes Jody here with his bony ankles, his pipe stem legs. So he's small and skinny. Um, it also describes him as having hard calloused feet. So he's used to working and he's used to working without shoes on. That's what that tells you. And so as he's there in the clear water that's there, um, it talks about this flutter mill. 
this flutter mill is a symbol for something. So it will appear again. Um, so you want to figure out and look for when it appears again and what you think it symbolizes. So it talks about a flutter mill and he kind of is getting up the gumption to make his own because it says before, Grandma Hutto's son, Oliver, who's a sailor, would always make it for him. So he thinks about how to make it and he, he's got to use the twigs and basically you make the twigs into a Y and then it has one straight st twig that goes across and then um, he makes the different fronds that stick out almost in a wheel and so it'll spin, it's on the, the Y, okay, the Y, this twig in the middle and it just spins with the current of the water, that's a flutter mill, okay. So he makes it, it works, and he's so excited, he just sits back, he's on the sand, it's beautiful, there's nature all around. And you could tell from the beginning, the way Jody looks at nature, he knows a lot about it. He can read tracks, he knows what happens in spring, he knows all kinds of plants and animals and etc. So as he's sitting there kind of enjoying the glen and the weather, because it's now spring, it's April, he falls asleep. And when he wakes up, the sun's been setting and it's about to rain and he notices the deer track, okay? Um, and, I mean, he literally can look at it and see that it sinks low. So that means he's that the fawn is big and, not fawn, the doe is big and probably is pregnant with a fawn, okay? So at this point, he kind of notices it's getting late and he decides probably should head home before he gets in trouble and before <clears throat> he gets all the uh he gets home um he does something we've probably all done as a child um <laughs> and he looks up at the sky and he spins and spins and spins in in one place if you've ever done that and you kind of get really dizzy and you're like wobbling all over the place so he does that and is just enjoying it's kind of like the the old saying spring fever that's what he has so he's so giddy with spring, he returns home to his stick and clay chimney cabin, okay? Um, he knows supper will be waiting. <clears throat> and um, at that point when he's getting home, he kind of thinks to himself, maybe I shouldn't have done what I just did and didn't do my work and left mom there. Probably shouldn't have done that. So <clears throat> when he gets home, he realizes not only is mom probably going to be mad at him but he realizes pa's home too penny baxter and he's like i'm busted i'm going to get in so much trouble okay so it describes and it says more than once in here the end of winter had been meager corn short and hay and dried cow peas so it gives you the picture that they're excited for spring because spring means things will grow and if things grow, that means they can replenish the stock of items that they have, like corn and hay and cow peas. So it tells you the end of winter is really, really hard, which is why spring is so exciting to the Baxter family. So Penny Baxter is there. He's at the woodpile doing the chores that uh, his son should be doing. And so it describes him um, as gentle and it also describes him, uh, it talks about his hands, and you understand why in a little bit, but his hands are bigger than his body, like they're big for his body, okay? So <laughs> Jody runs up and tries to jump in and help, and of course, Penny finds out the truth that he went to the Glen and kind of goofed off all day and enjoyed the day because it was pretty outside. And <clears throat> in this little section, you see just a snippet of their relationship. So should he get in trouble for what he's done? Yes. But as far as Penny is concerned, if he was a boy, he would have done the same thing. And so they're going to keep it between the two of them. And he gives them a little wink. So you can see the close relationship that Jody and Penny have with one another. So they get some work done, some milking the wood, etc. They wash up before supper and then you get to meet Ma Baxter. So it it, it describes her way more than once as a bulky. She's a big woman, okay? And she makes food, and because spring is here, she can 
like there's an abundance and they're excited about that. So uh, it talks about in there, again, after a lean winter and a slow spring with food not uh, much more plentiful for the Baxters than their stock, like this supper, this first one we see is something that's exciting to them. So greens with bacon, um, it calls sand boogers or buggers, okay? Um, made of potato and onion. All that is, is just like hash browns with onions. Um, and then it says the cooter he had found crawling yesterday, which is a turtle. So if there are terms in here you don't get because we don't use them anymore, I'll look them up, okay? And then orange biscuits, sweet potato pone, which is kind of like sweet potato pie. And <clears throat> they're, of course, eating and they're so excited that they're actually, they have a meal that makes them full and that they have leftovers, okay? So they talk about a full moon in spring means the bears are waking up. And this is the first time you're introduced to old Slewfoot. Um, he's pivotal to this story. You see him in and out through several chapters. So <clears throat> they're going to, uh, they talk about or get excited about going hunting for old Slewfoot. Um, and <clears throat> they kind of finish dinner and they're laughing and joking Spring kind of does that for them. It's less stressful because they have more of the things that they need, like food and crops and et cetera. So <clears throat> you have the first mention of the foresters in here, just, just very brief. And it says he was as drunk as Lim Forrester on a Saturday night. The foresters are also important um, to this story. So anytime you see their family described or any of them described, it's going to be important for you to pay attention to. Okay. So chapter two, it's at night and um, Penny's kind of lying awake in bed and he is thinking about his childhood. Okay. So you find out a lot about Penny in this moment and you also found out why he doesn't pick at his son for being a boy okay and having fun and going to the glen so <clears throat> he says um a boy ain't a boy too long so he wants his son to have those moments where he's a kid and to enjoy his childhood because as far as penny's childhood he did not enjoy it it says his father had been a preacher, stern as the Old Testament. He was raised in a large family. Uh, they were taught young to read and uh, write and learn the scriptures. And it says from the moment that they literally could walk, their father had them working. Okay, And it said they toiled until their small bones ached, uh, planting seeds and all that kind of stuff. And it says their rations had been short. They know... Um, they had hookworm, and it says because of the lack of food, how hard they work, worked as a child, the hookworm, that's why Penny was so small. So his hands are big, but he is tiny because he was malnourished and overworked as a kid, okay? He didn't know any type of grace, and it literally said if Penny had done that as a child, his father, just out of spite, would have made, made him go all the way back to the Glen and rip out that flutter mill. So there was not an ounce of enjoyment in his childhood whatsoever. And that's why he's called Penny, okay? So Lim Forrester gave him that nickname, uh, Old Penny Peace You. So um, his real name, Penny, is Ezra Ezekiel Baxter. But literally, he's just called Penny because he's so tiny. Um, you learn a lot about him in these first couple of chapters. And in this chapter, you learn that he is always honest and truthful. Okay, always to a fault. Um, and <clears throat> as far as Penny, it also talks about why they live out in the middle of nowhere on Baxter's Island. For him, men and people equal hurt to him. They're always in their business. Uh, people can spread rumors. People are harsh in their words. And for him, um, he wanted to get away from that. For him, nature is healing and honest. Um, human beings are unpredictable and cruel. So he marries, in his 30s, he marries Ma Baxter, who's twice his age and twice, probably more than twice his size. 
um, not twice his age, twice his size. I read that wrong. I'm sorry. And <clears throat> loaded her up and took her out into the middle of nowhere to this pine island that he eventually buys from the foresters. And the foresters still live out there in the middle of nowhere, too. They live about four miles away. So they are the nearest people to the Baxters. So think about it. If you live in the middle of nowhere, if something bad happens and you need help, they're the nearest people that they could get help from is the foresters. And they are four miles away. So that's important. So he buys the um, Baxter's Island, as they call it. And it says, really, the only drawback to the island is that they don't have access to water. Water, the water source of St. Cole is far away. I mean, the Glen. Um, so they don't have easy access to water. So Ma Baxter, um, or her name is Aura. It says, um, because she's bulky, think about the time frame, a bulkier woman with thicker hips was more apt to be able to bear a lot of children. And she's built for children, but it says the babies were frail and almost as fast as they came, they sickened and they died. So it says out on their property, there's five babies that are buried. Okay. And... <clears throat> Eventually, they, they get Jody, and he was born, and he lives. And it says when the baby was two years old, that Penny had to go off to war. And <clears throat> when he came back, at the, it says he had come back at the end of four years with the mark of age on him. So he's gone for a couple of years, and he comes back. And it says as far as parents, Ma Baxter is standoffish and you can understand it after losing that many children it's almost like she's standoffish because she's so used to all of her babies dying she doesn't want to get attached to them so she has kind of a strained standoffish relationship with their son sometimes you see her being endearing but more often than not she's not comforting she's not loving um, you don't see any of that between her and her son you do see that between Penny and his son. And it says, since he was young, just like Penny, his son Jody has a love for nature and has always stared at it in all just like Penny has. So he has that love as well. Okay. So um, after kind of going through those memories and the flashback, I mean, he feels bad for not telling the truth, although she finds out. Um, it, uh, Jody can't help it um, when they're talking about it. Although he, um, he feels bad for kind of allowing his son not to do his chores and not punishing him for it. Because she knows eventually he's going to have to do it. He wants him to en enjoy his childhood in being a boy. At least right now. Okay. So chapter three. Um, they <laughs> get up early. And you have them getting ready for breakfast. And this is when you get... A little bit more of a description of Jody with his freckles, his straw hair. He's really thin. Um, he's fair. He has a really small face. He's small. He's got high cheekbones and kind of high ears that stick out a little bit. And he kind of calls himself ugly. And he wishes he had a tan and had a, a darker complexion like the foresters do. And you have this statement from Ma that says, Them fellers is black as their hearts. Okay, so... <clears throat> You've got Lim Forrester, who's drunk all the time. Lim Forrester, who gave Penny his nickname. And then that they're, um, that the Forresters is, are black in, in their hearts. You've gotten so far, okay? And <clears throat> as far as Lim Forrester, it also talks about, and you notice it's kind of focusing on Lim a little bit. That um, he kind of made fun of Jody and how he looked, and Jody always remembers that, so he feels a little self conscious. So, the next section you have um, the dogs outside going crazy, especially old Julia. She's the most trustworthy as far as hunting. And old Slewfoot, here he is. And he's, he's sneaked into Baxter's Island and he's killed their brood sow, Betsy. Okay? So for them, that's a big deal. A brood sow is a, a, a pig that you use basically um, 
to grow and basically get pregnant. And then so you can have more and more pigs. So your brood sow is how you raise multiple pigs. You basically use her to have babies and those babies you use for meat for the hard winter. So that's why Ma Baxter is extremely angry. And um, and that's why they kind of set out to go um, and hunt Old Slewfoot. Because for them, Old Slewfoot wasn't hungry. Slewfoot just came in there to kill just because. And <clears throat> that's um, it's kind of showing you why Slewfoot is... Like everybody knows Old Slewfoot. And that's why the Baxters want to kill him. Because he comes in and he kills things just because and he's the one that's hard to catch the dogs didn't even scent to the bear like this bear is infamous okay so they have to um go out and then you have uh the hunt if you will for slewfoot and that's what chapter four is all about so they're getting ready to go hunting they pack up um supplies and food and all that kind of stuff for them and for the dogs and they head out to for Slewfoot. The and they call him Slewfoot because he's missing the toe. And that's how, I mean they always can tell it's him by his tracks. So you can tell old Julia like runs the hunt. And as far as um, the new Feist, he's really the one. And you see him. He runs off. He's new. He hasn't been trained, but he's not very good when it comes to. I mean, when you get to the point where they catch the bear, he doesn't want a piece of it, okay? So they're going through, old Julia's following him, and eventually they get to the bay and to the creek, which is a hard place because there's water. So you get to the point where they get to the bear, and the dogs attack, and Penny gets his rifle ready, but it backfires and knocks him down. So at this point, it's two dogs against this massive bear, and... The two dogs get hurt, especially Julia and um, Penny. Uh, I mean, in this moment, Julia's got the bear she, by the throat and she won't let go. And Penny's, I mean, this, he's tiny, but this shows you he's brave. And he's going through and he's pounding and he's pounding and he's pounding. And the bear takes off and old Julia doesn't let go until he gets across the creek. And in this moment, you learn, a, especially on the hunt, you learn a lot about Penny um, you see how brave he is. You also see how much he knows about hunting. It even says he out hunts the forest. He out hunts everybody. Um, you also learn that for him, he has a, a respect for nature, not like the foresters that just go out to hunt, to hunt and kill and whatever. Um, he only hunts and kills when he has to. And that's why he's hunting old Slewfoot, because if he doesn't kill him, then Slewfoot will continue um, to come into Baxter's Island and kill like their pig, those things that they have to have to survive. Okay, so eventually Pa gets Julia back, and he uh, Julia old Julia's torn up, and they don't know if they'll make it. So they walk all the way back, and Ma's like, "I got no bear, and um, and maybe a dog that will die." So you see Penny <clears throat> take care of the dog, sew her up, and doctor her, and he's going to keep her inside. And here's where Ma draws the line, like, mm-mm, not in my room. And you can see that Ma's not really concerned. They eat dinner. Penny doesn't want to eat anything. So <clears throat> that night, he stays in uh, Jody's room with him to keep an eye on old Julia. And they kind of talk about the um, kind of how nature works. Because for Jody, it makes him mad that old Slewfoot would be doing this and that Julia's hurt and etc. But um, for Penny, he's like, that's just nature. They go out and they kill. They got to eat. That, and for him, he can understand nature more than he can understand human beings. And that's why he likes to be where he is. Um, so and at the very end, this is important. Of chapter four, Jody's lying there in bed with his father, and it says Baxter's Island seemed seemed to him a fortress ringed around with hunger, but Baxter's Island um, was always safe to him, 
And Penny kind of replies to him that creatures are only doing the same when, when, as when he goes hunting. It's either kill or go hungry. And he can understand that. So as far as um, Jody, <clears throat> he's trying to grasp that, but it makes him a little unnerved when they come into Baxter's Island. Because for him, it's like Baxter's Island is safe. Especially, and it says... Um, with his father. It says his father was the core of safety. His father swam the swift creek to fetch back his wounded dog. The clearing was safe and his father fought for it and for his own. And with that feeling, with his father there, um, Jody feels safe. Like nothing could harm him there in the middle of Baxter's Island as long as his father is there. And that is chapters one through four.